thanks a lot for coming out tonight. Um, as Kyle mentioned, I'm a PhD student at Northwestern um, and currently working on dissertation research as a, um, uh, I don't know, what is my status? A junior research, well, I always forget the title. Um, anyway, I'm working on uh, doing some archival research for my dissertation, uh, which broadly construed is about relations between North and South Korea in the late Cold War period. So 1980s through 1990s. And what I'll be presenting on tonight is kind of cold from that, um, but I'll just make a few kind of preface remarks and then uh, get into it. I do have a formal presentation prepared, but I'll try to um, punctuate it with some less formal remarks to keep it a little <laughs> more lively. And it is an art history presentation, so there's lots of pictures, so it's maybe less <laughs> unbearable than it could be. Um, so just to start, the kind of broad question that brought me to this project was um, when I was here actually teaching English um, too, too long ago now, um, I went to an exhibition that um, pinned together works from South Korea in the 70s and 80s, uh, which I'll show a little bit of in a, a minute, but it just kind of got me wondering what is the, what is if any, uh, relationship between North and South Korea. And in the late Cold War period in particular, when we think of works from South Korea, uh, an artist that might come to mind is Nam Joon Baek. And so we're looking here at a uh, work called The More the Better that was produced for, uh, to coincide with the 1988 Olympics. And it kind of has all of the visual hallmarks of uh, what we generally think of as sort of global contemporary art. So he is an in working internationally at this point, based in New York. Um, it's a new media installation comprised of 1,003 television monitors mm -hmm. sponsored by the multinational uh, conglomerate Samsung. <laughs> and then when we think of art in North Korea, a lot of times people ask me, um, does it exist at all? And you know, usually we think of something kind of uh, scary, like this um, <laughs> portrait by one of the, the most, um, he's the head of the uh, Joseon Hwa uh, division of Mansu Day Art Studio, which is the sort of state organized art studio in Pyongyang. And if you've seen any pictures of Pyongyang, you probably have seen this portrait because it's um, plastered pretty much everywhere in buildings, um, even apartments. And so to think about a relationship between these, they seem uh, pretty diametrically opposed, but my argument broadly is that uh, there is a connection in the 1980s, in particular between what's called uh, minjung art in South Korea and artists working in North Korea. And so with that, I'll get into the presentation. On July 20th, 1985, South Korean authorities stormed Seoul's Arab Cultural Museum, confiscating a host of artworks and arresting 19 individuals connected to the exhibition, The Power of Korean Artists in Their 20s. And we're looking here just at an exhibition shot of that and then the pamphlet that was produced for it on the left. Organized by the Seoul art community, the exhibition had opened one week earlier bringing together the work of 30 young South Korean artists with the goal of establishing the so-called national art. Cultural Minister Lee Won Hong offered an ostensible justification for the state's censorship of the exhibition the same day when he spoke at the general meeting of the Artists Association. In a speech titled Concerns about the Anti-Democratic Instrumentalization of Popular Culture, he alleged that the artists in the exhibition had mobilized art as an instrument of struggle within the anti-establishment movement, primarily because they identified with the poor, hungry minjung. So loosely translating as people, the term minjung refers to a theory of history privileging the perspectives of the socially marginalized. And it emerged in colonial Korea in the early 20th century. By the 1960s, it had become a cohesive political and social movement in South Korea. Participants in the movement strove to emulate the peasant farming culture of the Joseon dynasty, which they envisioned as a utopian alternative to the deleterious conditions of modernity in South Korea under the authoritarian rule of Park chung hee The Minjun cultural movement spread exponentially throughout South Korea during the 1980s, 
and played a pivotal role in the 1987 June democracy movement when citizens across the country engaged in mass protests, which led to dem democratic reforms in the country's first open elections. Now, following the cultural minister's assertion that the artists in the uh, Arab Cultural Museum exhibition sympathized with the Minjung, the artists rightly adopted the term as descriptive of their work. Uh, the Minjung art movement subsequently became codified as a genre of artistic practice. And the artists associated with this movement uh, had previously been labeled as the new art movement or national art. So the majority of these artists deliberately positioned their work against tansaekwa, or uh, Korean monochromatic painting. And this is a movement that had dominated the Korean art world. Uh, we're looking at just a kind of emblematic example from the artist Yu Fang. Uh, had dominated the <coughs> Korean art world throughout the 60s and 70s. And Minjung sympathizers understood Tonsekwa artists' embrace of pure abstraction as a capitulation to Western modernism and chastised abstract painters for neglecting what they understood as the moral obligation of cultural workers uh, to unequivocally confront uh, urgent social and political concerns. So in their work, in contrast, Minjung artists initiated a revival of figurative realism often appropriating motifs from popular folk genre painting, the Joseon dynasty, and they turned also to indigenous Korean traditions, such as Taochum, uh, mass dance, and later to new media forms, such as photo montage, and an unremitting effort to connect with what they ambiguously referred to as hyunshio, or the reality of the people. And so this is just another emblematic work from a uh, Minjung artist named Shinak Cho. And this caused quite a bit of controversy because uh, the state claimed that he had represented North Korea in the upper portion, um, you'll see the circular formation of Mount Baekdu up there, uh, as a socialist utopia. And then the South has all the detritus of uh, capitalist wasteland. So uh, Rambo can be pictured, is pictured in there, um, Coca-Cola. And then the text at the bottom is, um, uh, is the, the Korean translation of a, a film from the 1980s uh, starring Chuck Norris called Invasion USA, uh, in which he uh, does a bunch of roundhouse kicks in order to defeat the Soviet Union uh, when they invade Florida. And so this caused a, quite a bit of controversy, and Chinook Chul was actually arrested for it. The painting was seized, and it, it went on a very lengthy trial going all the way to the United Nations uh, Human Rights Council in 2004. So just to give you a sense of like, how serious this kind of work uh, was taken by the state. So beyond giving the Minjung movement its namesake, the cultural minister's specific condemna condemnation of the work in the Arab Cultural Museum singled out an aspect of Minjung art seldom acknowledged in the historization of the movement, namely the relationship between Minjung art and North Korean communism. So in his speech, he argued that by explicitly criticizing South Korea or South Korean society, the artists in the show had abetted the communist government of North Korea. And so here's what he said. Even though they are small in number, we have come to see that there are some individuals in the art world who have a negative view of our social reality and who regard incidental and accidental phenomena as representative of reality or who manipulate the facts themselves, using art as a tool to shape them. Even if not explicitly directed at North Korean communism, where artistic and cultural activities are fully controlled, using the artistic freedom provided and guaranteed by the South Korean government in this way is beneficial to North Korean communism. Now, to be sure, such rhetoric was rampant in post-war South Korea. And following the division of the peninsula at the 38th parallel in 1945, the South Korean government routinely invoked North Korea in order to arouse public fear and to justify acts of censorship. Due to intense pen penalties that inevitably followed from accusations of being a communist sympathizer, South Korean artists rarely addressed North Korea directly in their work during the early 1980s. However, Yi's indictment of the artists in the Arab Cultural Museum show came at a time when the Minjung cultural movement at large, as well as Minjung artists, began to explicitly engage with North Korea. 
Concurrent with the exhibition, for instance, students at Seoul National University publicly announced that they listened regularly to North Korean radio broadcasts in direct violation of South Korea's national security law. And their daring pronouncement coincided with the formation of the Juche group, a faction of the Minju movement that defined itself by its adherence to the ideology promoted by the North Korean state. And likewise, during the mid-1980s, Minjung artists began producing works that openly appealed for reunification with North Korea. So as interest in the prospects of North Korea's communist political system became an increasingly central component of the Minjung movement, North Korean artists simultaneously began invoking Minjung, the Minjung movement in their own work, operating primarily within the stylistic parameters of socialist realism which had become methodized and prescribed by the state during the 1960s. Images of Minjun participants, and especially student activists, became progressively prominent in North Korean visual culture during the 1980s. Uh, and, and this is concurrent with uh, South Korean activists intensifying their efforts to initiate talks on reunification. Tensions between Minjung activists and the South Korean state reached fever pitch in July 1989 when Pyongyang hosted the 13th World Festival of Youth and Students. In order to participate in the event, uh, as a representative of Chondaeho, uh, the South, South Korea's National Association of uh, University Student Councils, Im Soo Kyung, a student activist at uh, the University of Foreign Studies, violated South Korea's uh, ban on unauthorized travel to North Korea. Upon arriving in Pyongyang, North Koreans endowed him with the sobriquet Flower of Reunification, and she quickly became a preeminent symbol of reunification in both North and South Korean visual culture. And unable to attend the World Festival of Youth and Students themselves, Minjung artists organized an exhibition to be held in Pyongyang in conjunction with the festival. And given the impracticality of sending a large number of artworks across the border, what they did is send these um, small black and white uh, negatives and some slides to contacts in East Germany, who then passed them on to artists in Pyongyang. And the, the artists then recreated the Minjung, artists ba uh, Minjung artworks based off of these uh, tiny photographic negatives and the slides. So in the upper right corner, we're looking at just a kind of collectively produced uh, mural painting uh, showing the history of the National Liberation Movement. And then in uh, the lower uh, right-hand corner is a, a photograph that appeared in a North Korean newspaper around that time showing the, the recreation of it and North Koreans uh, looking at it at, at that exhibition. So to look at the first um, case study, the first thing that I'm going to start um, uh, talking about or looking at is the artist's ways of responding to the Gwangju uprising, uh, which happened in 1980. And after that, uh, artists really started to consider um, the question of how their work was going to be operative in South Korean society, um, given the sort of exigent circumstances. So they're just really asking themselves, um, how, how is it that I, as a cultural producer, what role am I, as a cultural producer, going to have um, in this very widespread democratization movement? Now, closely bound to the term hyunshil, or reality, uh, the term hyunjang became very important in Minjung discourse. And this uh, loosely translates something like sites of the real and denotes the concrete spatio-temporal circumstances surrounding public demonstrations against the state apparatus. And so in the 1980s, Minjung organizers invoked the notion of hyunjang predominantly in calls for South Korean activists and cultural workers to participate in local struggles with attention to the immediate needs of communities facing oppression from the state. For Minjung vi visual artists, this often entailed leaving the confines of the gallery in order to more directly collaborate with socially despised publics. Yeah. Indeed, me, uh, many Minjung artists took it at, uh, as their moral responsibility to participate in political protests by producing ephemeral banners, placards, uh, and backdrops for such events, renouncing formal experimentation and technical innovation 
Their chief objective was to calibrate the form and content of their work to the historical and political contingencies given uh, contingencies of a specific given site of the real. And so here we're looking at an artist named Choi Byung Su, who's a carpenter by training. Uh, and in 1987, uh, shortly before the June democracy movement, there was a, a protest in Seoul in which uh, Lee Han Yeol, uh, a protest, student protester, was hit by a um, grenade uh, canister and was seriously, ultimately fatally injured. But Choi Byung Su, uh, produced the portraits that were used in the memorials that took place um, just a few days after that event. And so you can see the, the funeral portrait being um, kind of wheeled through the streets of Seoul, and then all of the participants as well are holding these small uh, reproductions of that. So it's one way that an artist was uh, trying to think about, you know, how do I operate outside of the gallery system, and how do I uh, enter into these sort of sites of the real? The pursuit of Hyunjang finds its root in the 1980 Guangzhou uprising, when a violent confrontation erupted uh, after military police descended upon Guangzhou in South Korea, Korea's Jona province uh, to stifle a student demonstration underway at Jonam National University. Youth activists and citizens in Guangzhou subsequently formed a coalition and temporarily drove military forces out of the city for an onslaught of reinforcements forcibly ended the revolt. The Gwangju uprising served as a catalyst for artists in South Korea who, over the course of the 1980s, attempted to counter official narratives of the event propagated by the state-run media, which invariably cast the student activists as instigators of civil unrest and collaborators with communist North Korea. Simultaneously, the Gwangju uprising galvanized artists in North Korea who saw the tragedy as unimpeachable evidence of the asperity plaguing the southern half of the peninsula under the military dictatorship of Chun Du Hwan. Images and reports of the uprising were presented as confirmation of Kim Il Sung's harrowing characterizations of South Korea, which he consistently invoked following his rise to power in North <coughs> Korea in the late 1940s. Throughout the 1980s, the Gwangju uprising figured as a prominent subject for North Korean painters, illustrators, and documentarians, who, in addition to denouncing the Chun re regime, extolled South Korean student activists as heroic martyrs for the socialist revolution and the re reunification of the peninsula. So although the term Hyunjang did not feature fulsomely in North Korean discourse on the Gwangju uprising, North Korean artists unambiguously thematized the South Korean streets as sites of the real in a commensurable manner, casting such public spaces as a field of contestation where youth revolutionaries challenge the so-called puppet regime of the South and its American benefactors. North Korea's framing of the <coughs> uprising sparked what would become a widespread interest in its communist political system on part of Minjung activists and artists. Indeed, during the uprising, student activists found that illicit North Korean radio broadcasts reported more accurate information about the revolt than the official South Korean media. And this revelation prompted them to question the South Korean state's insistent demonization of North Korea and to envision the vir virtually unknown northern half of the peninsula as a socialist utopia and a veritable anti antithesis to life under the despotic regimes that had ruled South Korea in relentless succession. Although no direct contact between artists based in North and South Korea is known to have transpired in the early 1980s, the work that they produced in response to the Gwangju uprising nevertheless intersected at a conceptual level, especially in their framing of the South Korean streets as a predominant domain of radical politics. Casting the South Korean student activists as a vanguard of reunification efforts, artists on both sides of the peninsula imagined Hyunjong as a space from which a socialist revolution would unfold, leading to the reconciliation of the peninsula. So rep representations of the Gwangju uprising, I argue, paved a way for the aesthetic and poli political alliances between Minjung artists and North Korean artists that would develop in the later part of uh, the, the 1980s and in the early 1990s. So just a couple of uh, words about uh, background on the Gwangju uprising. Uh, following a coup d'etat that would eventually lead to his uh, assumption of the presidency, 
Zhang Duquan, the acting director of the Korean Central Intelligence Agency, expanded martial law across South Korea on May 17, 1980. And the military government uh, concomitantly ordered the closing of public universities nationwide and banned all political activism in response to what they said was an invasion of North Korean spies. The morning after the, the announcement, around 200 students gathered in protest in front of Chonan National University in Gwangju. And the number grew exponentially as military officers uh, arrived on scene and stormed the campus, making arrests and beating demonstrators and bystanders. As violence in Guangzhou escalated over the course <coughs> of several days, a core group of student activists led civilians in scavenging for weaponry and forming a so-called citizen's army to counter the assaults of the military officers. So when the hastily assembled civilian militia began firing what ammunition they had managed to collect, the South Korean military retreated to the suburbs of Gwangju, sealing off all routes in and out of the city, such that uh, Gwangju effectively became an autonomous community, isolated from the rest of the country. And so during this stage of the uprising, the community that emerged in Gwangju presented itself as an alternative to the social structures born under capitalism in post-war South Korea. So uh, South, um, store uh, owners, for instance, uh, pretty much like put all of their all of the contents of their stores out into the streets, uh, where the civilian army could you know, take them for free, and it became this kind of um, sort of model microcosm community of an alternative to South Korea as a whole. The citizens maintained control of the city until May 27th, when the military again moved in on protesters who had gathered at Provincial Hall overthrowing the activists and forcibly ending uh, the uprising. But however short-lived, the Guangzhou uprising proved formative for the Minju movement, shaping the dominant ideological framework and inspiring a range of tactics by which participants would resist the military government throughout the coming decade. Now, the most active artist group to take part in the uprising was the Guangzhou Liberal Artists Association, or in Korean uh, short version as uh, Guangzhou. Uh, and they played a significant role in establishing tactics that Minjun collectives and activists across South Korea would emulate in an effort to collapse art practice into hyeonjang. So according to Hong Songdam, uh, the de facto leader of the group, in the days preceding the uprising, the group sensed their growing unrest within the city and consequently began hastily documenting slogans and chants that they heard in the streets. And when the uprising broke out, the group took to the streets, uh, producing placards emblazoned with uh, the watchwords that they had recorded, as well as spray painting slogans on sidewalks and telephone poles. So minimal documentation of this kind of work exists, but we do have some uh, written descriptions of Guangzhou at the time that uh, kind of reveal how uh, their interventions had an impact on the, the sort of urban environment in the city. And so, uh, one eyewitness recalls, signs and banners appeared on automobiles, posters were plastered on the walls, banners waved in the wind as they stretched across the streets, Chun Du Kwan subverted democracy, tear butcher Chun the pieces, uh, free Kim Dae Jun, revenge for the blood of Guangzhou, secure workers' rights, free detained students and people, we defend Guangzhou with our lives. Such interventions were driven by the ideas expressed in Guang Zhaohyop's founding manifesto of July 1979, presaging the centrality of the notion of Hyeonjang uh, and what the place it would hold in the discourse surrounding the Minjung uh, movement and artistic practice. Their manifesto stresses the obligation of artists to directly confront material circumstances from which social problems arise. And to do so, they kind of ambiguously explained that artists should strive to produce works that function akin to testimony and speech. So although the manifesto offers no precise instructions of how artists, uh, or in indication of how they originally envisioned such testimonial works taking form, their improvised practices during the uprising of distributing and broadcasting slogans uh, plainly evidence the desire to amplify the voices of the oppressed through visual enunciation. And so one, this kind of became a, a model for uh, 
how Minjung artists would then think about their work because as you can see from this, even from this short description, it would have been basically impossible to tell the difference between uh, which of these slogans have been, are, were like an artwork produced by an art collective and which were just um, spontaneously um, you know, acts, acts of protest on part of the citizens. So it was kind of seen as this um, uh, sort of ultimate uh, dissolution of art into social practice. So the experience of the uprising definitively altered the trajectory of Gorm Jahop's practice. While the group had intended to hold an inaugural exhibition in May 1980, they canceled the show after the uprising, electing instead to perform a shamanic ritual in Nampyeong Riverside Field on the outskirts of Gwangju. And participants in the performance read aloud uh, the founding manifesto, reiterating what they understood as the responsibility of artists to insert themselves directly in confrontations with the state. And this question of how to pursue the court, the, this kind of artistic practice in the aftermath of the uprising would occupy the group for several years. For example, in his opening speech during the 1983 seminar, uh, Hong Songdam rephra uh, rephrased the primary objective of the group, asserting that they must maintain a commitment to what he said, or what he called returning art, the art of our time to society. For Hong, this required artists to act as facilitators of collaboration with the public, and thereby returning art so that it is not just a message to the people, but also an art made by the people. And Hong maintained that to return art to society, artists must operate outside of the conf confines of the gallery and take art to the streets. And how he put it, I think art, uh, only by going out into the square can we join with our neighbors in universal sympathy. So one way in which Wan Jia Hop uh, attempted to return art to society was by operating a night school in which they offered art classes to Guangzhou students and workers. Hong uh, merged his artistic practice with this pedagogical enterprise, producing designs for woodblock prints that were then used in the association's work workshops as participants produced and distributed images printed from Hong's designs. For Hong, this ensured that the mode of production aligned, with, uh, aligned and remained consistent with the pointed contents of his prints, which forcefully advocated for collectivity in the face of tyranny. One of Hong's earliest prints, The Spectators, from 1981, lays bare Hong Jiaxiao's uh, steadfast avowal to collaboration and collective resistance and their refusal to accept anything less than direct participation in protests and demonstrations against the state. The picture emphatically lambasts those who withdrew to the sidelines during the Guangzhou uprising, depicting a cohort of six figures peering down from the upper window of a brick high-rise. The viewer assumes a vantage point level with the disgraced spectators, estranged from the revolutionary activities unfolding in the streets below, to which the hunched uh, figure in the foreground uh, gestures by pointing beyond the lower edge of the frame. Bringing the viewer face to face with idle observers, Hong implicates us in his wholesale indictment of spectatorial passivity. The attitude in evidence here uh, suffused the Minju movement after the Guangzhou uprising, when many intellectuals decried their own subject position, which they saw as tainted uh, by cowardliness and indecisiveness in comparison with those who had perished in the final stand of the revolt. By contrast, intellectuals and artists included in that category understood workers as possessing a superior degree of moral purity. Minjung leaders repeatedly revered uh, the seemingly spontaneous participation of workers in the Guangzhou uprising, such as when employees of the city's transportation uh, services division took part in a demonstration involving over 200 taxi cabs and buses. After witnessing the city uh, employees organize against the military forces, one observer remarked, for instance, quote, the workers threw their bodies into the arena of history. It was a beautiful moment. Their solidarity and commitment were the zenith of the Guangzhou uprising, end quote. Such sentiments uh, emerged in large part because of the distressing <coughs> documentary video footage that began circulating in South Korea after the uprising. Amateur documentary documentarians 
uh, dedicated themselves to revealing the violence committed by the military government in Guangzhou, relying mostly on foreign news broadcasts, which they edited together in various narrative configurations. <coughs> Despite uh, the South Korean state's attempts to control documentation of the uprising by limiting access to the scene, uh, the German reporter, Jürgen uh, Hinspeter, had sur surreptitiously entered the city on May 19th to film the turmoil. Excuse me. Significantly, much of the footage that uh, Hinspeter captured during the, the uprising departed from the tendency of media images to show wide uh, shots of the protesters across the city, um, kind of trying to reinforce their narrative that the uprising had been spurred by sort of riotous uh, group. And so instead, Hinspeter wanders among the city, capturing shots of individual members of the citizens' army, and even riding in the back of vehicles with the protesters. <clears throat> the viewer thus vicariously experiences being on the front lines of the revolt, and thus becomes acutely aware of their non-participation in the actual event. Read in this light, in light of this context, homes the spectators can therefore be understood as extending from and perpetuating the deep uh, shame uh, harbored by intellectuals in the wake of the uprising. For, uh, we might compare the spectators then with one of Holmes' later pictures, which offers a view from the streets during the uprising. Titled, Let's Go to the Provincial Hall, this 1988 print illustrates the final march of activists and citizens before the massacre that ensued at Guangzhou's Provincial Hall. In the foreground, demonstrators hoist torches and hurl stones at military vehicles. With their gazes directed at the public square before Provincial Hall, the figures bear few distinguishing characteristics. Indeed, they read as shadows as much as material bodies, portending their imminent demise at the helm of the state. In contrast to the spectators, uh, the composition thrusts the viewer into the picture as the eye follows a map a mass of uh, capillaceous lines delineating a road which converge at the scene of an overturned automobile. In this work, Hong traced the, the uh, self-critical tenor of the, uh, the spectators for revolutionary zeal in an endeavor to propel the viewer into the streets uh, in the spirit of the Guangzhou martyrs. Now, Hong continued this uh, practice throughout the 1980s, and I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the talk that a lot of Minjung artists then sent their works abroad to North Korea, and Hong was one of those. Um, you see this print right here is one of his works that was produced in 1989 that he sent to North Korea, and then he was subsequently arrested. And so uh, the Minjung movement as a whole then kind of saw uh, his work as tying into this project of reunification. So you can see his print here framed in a comic, uh, a comic that directly ties the Guangzhou uprising to uh, the project of reunification. So it's called From May to Reunification. So in the years following the uprising, the task of set forth by artists like Hong of going into the streets and participating on the front lines to <coughs> took form in multifarious practices at the level of everyday life. Excuse me. <coughs> so one method adopted by the students involved uh, dropping out of school and leaving home to become a so-called covert worker in factories. This oftentimes required the use of an alias as the Ministry of Labor's efforts to weed out so-called uh, disguised workers intensified as the practice gained notoriety throughout the 1980s. And the students' putative goal was to fully align their identity with that of the working class by infiltrating the workplace and facilitating uh, the organization of revolutionary activities from within. <coughs> to aid those who attempted to enter factories in this manner, one Minjung uh, organization produced a manual which provides instructions on how to um, homogenize with the working class. And so I'll just read um, one of the points here, which gives you a kind of idea about how they were trying to really construct this identity of um, you know, a sort of revolutionary subjectivity that was just constantly on the front lines with the working class. And so it says, in order to befriend workers, one has to invest lots of time 
and have a reservoir of conversation topics ready. When getting to know someone for the first time, accompany him wherever he goes, such as on walks, uh, shop, so be shopping, and going to stores, taverns, and pool halls. Do not slacken your pace while working. Do not complain about hard work, lest you be seen as making a fuss. However, it is not good to be seen as a workaholic either. One can always learn how workers talk and what they do for leisure by observing. Let's learn by imitating. So I wanted to end with the, the kind of discussion of how South Korean artists responded to the Gwangju uprising here. So we can see this kind of constant movement out into the streets uh, in this very concerted effort uh, to join with the working class. And so Min Jung artists' visualizations of Hyunjong found their correlate in a corpus of North Korean works depicting the South Korean student movement, which likewise proliferated in the wake of the Gwangju uprising. <clears throat> In these pictures, youth activists invariably stand as indicators of social unrest in the southern half of the peninsula, threatening to upend South the South Korean state and exercise American troops from the peninsula. Take, for example, an oil painting titled The Blaze of Anti-Americanism by Jong Sung Min and Park Jong Sam. The image shows two South Korean student leaders arousing a rhapsodic crowd from atop a pedestal by setting the American flag ablaze. The scene imagines the triumph of the South Korean Minjun movement over what was ubiquitously described in the North as American neo-imperialism and the South Korean puppet regime. That the North Korean state, which historically had demonstrated its willingness to suppress insurrection at all costs, would sanction such subject matter uh, and facilitate its dissemination speaks to the Kim regime's deep conviction that images of South Korean activists would be read unequivocally as signs of support for North Korea's own ideological stance. So consider the fact that just one year before this uh, image was produced, when the Tiananmen Square massacre broke out in Beijing, uh, the North Korean state recalled all of its North Korean, uh, all of its students studying abroad uh, for fear that they would be exposed to civilian protests against the government and fearing that the anti-state revolt might spread into North Korea as well. So despite this, the state's unequal paranoia about images of protests, South Korean youth activists became a re, uh, recurring subjects in North Korean art and visual culture throughout the 1980s. And artists capitalized on images of South Korean youth to convey uh, that the Chun government maintained little support in the South and that the illegitimate regime was under perpetual attack. So in mark, marked contrast to Hong's prints, Jong and Park's uh, painting deliberately cuts off the viewer's access from the protest scene. And so you can notice here that the artist sort of conspicuously positioned this protest sign as a kind of um, barrier between the viewer and the protest scene. So very different from um, the, the march to provincial hall that we saw in the print just a few minutes ago. So the implication is that North Korean viewers would have no reason to engage in such activity because they do not experience the direct violence and oppression of uh, the United States. And here again, this kind of act of closing off the scene to the viewer appears over and over again in uh, pretty much all representation of South Korea. So we're looking at now at another uh, image memorializing the, the Gwangju uprising. And you can see that the artist has kind of inserted this very bizarre, uh, almost curtain-like thing that uh, the figure's hand is reaching through and then the, the actual memorial monument as well, acting like a kind of um, uh, window frame by which the, the viewer then looks through at uh, the south. So by casting its chief adversary, the United States, as the perpetrator of the uprising, North Korea sought to guarantee that these otherwise um, unbridled ambitions of the students will be understood as coterminous with the scope of North Korea's own revolutionary project. A North Korean defector confirms as much in an account of how the initial reports of the Gwangju uprising were framed in Pyongyang. And so this is uh, uh, an account from a defector who writes, from May 18th to the 28th, North Korean state media reported on, the Gw on Gwangju continuously, intensively, every day. It was a great shock for all the people of North Korea and the South Korean military uh, that the South Korean military was shooting and welding clubs against their own civilians, 
The North Korean authorities explained that the South uh, Joseon or Korean military fascists, backed this and controlled by the U.S., had dispatched an airborne corps to massacre the civilians. Thus, the main enemy was the U.S. imperialists. Pyongyang also stressed that this incident stemmed from the people's desire for reunification. So the banner of anti-Americanism could only go so far, however, in guaranteeing that images of South Korean protesters would be interpreted in strict correspondence with uh, Pyongyang's party line. So the, the appearance of images showing South Korean students undermined several major claims uh, consistently advanced by the, uh, the Kim regime, including the idea that South Koreans con continue to live in a state of abject poverty following the devastation brought by the Korean War. And so one defector uh, recalled that, you know, they write, during the Gwangju uprising, we in North Korea were greatly surprised by what we saw. They used to tell us that people dressed in rags there, but these kids were so well dressed, end quote. And for North Korean viewers, then, images of South Korean youth activists gave rise to cognitive dissonance, underscoring tensions and discrepancies between what could be seen in state-sanctioned images of South Korea and the official mouthpiece of the state. So much like in South Korea, the, the first images to circulate in North Korea um, came from foreign news sources. And these were edited into documentaries of the uprising and uh, they, in comparison to the documentaries produced in the South, they predictably employ a more overtly hostile tone, um, castigating what they call the fascist clique of Chun Du Hwan, and inserting sort of menacing images of the South Korean leader against, uh, for example, shots of South Korean students torching his apogee during the uprising. So I think the, with the Gwangju images, what I wanted to get at is that uh, there is, on the one hand, uh, a parallel in the subject matter, right? But on the other hand, they're also acknowledging the limitations of the ideology of the Minju movement and the North Korean movement, and uh, acknowledging that this is not enough for re reunification, right? So as another case study, then, I want to turn to the 1989 World Festival of <coughs> Students which is what prompted the exhibition of South Korean art in North Korea. So a student at the universe, Seoul's University of Foreign Studies and a member of Chondaehyeop, South Korea's National Council of Student Representatives, uh, Im Soo Kyung had traveled for 10 days via Japan, Germany, and China in order to participate in the event, and then subsequently became a recurring figure in visual culture on both sides of the peninsula. So upon arriving in Pyongyang, Im found herself standing as a symbol of reconciliation. As she entered the stadium at the conclusion of the opening ceremony of the Parade of Nations, she was greeted by a standing ovation from the senior delegates in attendance, including uh, Kim Na Song and Kim Jong Il. With the entire stadium's attention directed at her, Im's fortitudinous resolve reflected the prospects of youth culture and pointed up the possibility that the international youth movement might play a pivotal role in dismantling the Cold War divisions that had left a seemingly indelible mark on the Korean Peninsula. Recalling the moment when Im entered the stadium, an Argentinian filmmaker wrote in a memoir, I think that all of us who saw her in 1989 in Pyongyang, men and women, were struck by the same things, a woman so young, so beautiful, so brave, who was determined to cross all political, military, and cultural barriers that were placed before her, a kind of Joan of Arc determined to sacrifice her life in the name of a whole generation for the legitimate desire uh, for the Pacific reunification of all her people, the reunification of Korea. At that moment, I felt that she, in and of herself, was the incarnation of all the utopias that one could imagine. And so North Korean artists certainly shared in these kind of sentiments. And then um, immediately after she left Korea in August, uh, mid-August of that year, uh, began producing portraits, uh, sort of homage to her. So one of the first portraits of her is a, a really ambiguous one, or ambitious one, titled International Peace March. 
And this uh, uh, picture is uh, a demonstration that Ahmed led in North Korea when she led 400 international participants from Mount Bekdu in uh, the northern uh, part of the, the peninsula to the 38th parallel, where she planned to, to cross back into South Korea by walking across the, the demilitarized zone. The work stands three and a half meters tall and stretches to a massive 40 meters in length. <coughs> Rendered in Chosunhua or ink and color on paper, the painting assumes the form of a folding screen and narrates in four moments, uh, four moments from the march. The painting begins showing him uh, uh, marching from Mount Bektu, the mythical origin point of the Korean nation. Uh, in section two, she is shown entering Pyongyang through the Arch of Triumph. Section three shows him's arrival at Panmunjom, the meeting point between North and South Korea at the 38th parallel. And finally, section four uh, concludes with a depiction of a confrontation between student activists and the South Korean riot police who blocked the marchers from crossing the demilitarized zone. So led by Jung Yong Man and Kim Song Min, uh, Kim Song Min is the, also the artist who did the portrait of uh, Kim Il Song that I showed at the beginning. Uh, the brigade responsible for the painting consisted of 33 artists and completed in just 15 days. North Korean art critics lauded it as a preeminent example of an artistic speed battle akin to those regularly carried out in industrial and agricultural fields. The first uh, section prominently displays a long banner uh, with the slogan, our country is one, our wish is reunification. Hemming the young protagonist within an aggregate textual frame, the banner conjoins visually with a host of flags upraised by fellow marchers. Now, this compositional focal point sets the work apart from nearly all precedents for scenes set on Mount Bektu, many of which were also painted by Jong Yong Man, a co-leader of the brigade. And such scenes are generally absent of any text and depict Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il as kind of rigid monuments impervious to the, the turbulent environmental conditions. By contrast, in International Peace March, the flags and banners encircling Im Suk Kyung barely maintain their fracturable configuration, thrashing violently in the turbulent atmosphere. So while the mountainous surroundings in the picture bear the conventional lineaments of Joseon Wa landscape painting, the soft washes and muted palette are thrown into relief by the artist's audacious re rendering of text in the center of the image. Dense lines forming the phrase Korean is one in reverse across the fluttering flag at the top of the painting seem to bleed through the fibers of the banner. It's the dark contours of the Roman characters cut through the atmospheric fog. Also notable is the red banner raised by a shouting man to Im's right. You hear a radiant uh, reflection and dramatic folds deform the faint golden text, threatening to render it illegible. So commenting on this unruly treatment of the written word in the scene, one anonymous North Korean critic likened the banners in the image to quote unquote sparks from a blast furnace. And the critic's remark suggests a reading of the text and the overall treatment of the scene in contrast to its propagandistic content. And from this standpoint, the painting shows how Im Suk Kyung, uh, circumscribed by ling linguistic signifiers, uh, constitute a volatile relation of forces rather than a fixed and rigid uh, system of meaning. So I just uh, wanted to get at here how unusual this kind of treatment of ink painting is in North Korea and visual culture at this time. And so uh, Im's presence really mm, kind of forces North Korean artists to think about what, what mode of representation is going to capture the sheer amount of force that the South Korean student activist uh, seems to have brought. In section three of the work, Im Soo Kyung's name appears in writing for the first time on a banner calling for South Korea to allow her to cross the 38th parallel. Here, her surname is denoted by the North Korean spelling Lim. In section four, the protagonist does not appear at all apart from her name, which is repeated on the separate banner carried by protesters attempting to cross the, demili the demilitarized zone. On this banner, her family name is written using the South Korean spelling, or Im. The orthographic shift here between the two scenes animates the act of border crossing 
drawing a conceptual par parallel between the linguistic signals of the divide, the different spellings, and the militaristic forces bifurcating the peninsula. And the artists show how him standing as a symbol of unity is paradoxically underwritten by a splintered pair of linguistic signs reflecting and reinscribing the state of division. So while many would accuse him of allowing herself to be used as propaganda by North Korea, in actuality, I think, him provocatively straddled the various ideological positions set forth by the festival committee, committees, uh, the, the South Korean Minjung activists, and the North Korean state, never fully aligning herself with any uh, particular framework aside from a strong but sweeping call for reunification of the Korean Peninsula. And thus positioned herself uncomfortably amongst the various actors invested in consolidating specific readings of her presence in North Korea. So although, although the North Korean state endorsed them as promoting her, uh, promoting her as a token of reunification and a re representative of over one million South Korean students who had been barred by the South Korean state from attending the festival, she strayed significantly from the conception of proper revolutionary youth culture so scrupulously defined by the state. So as the scholar Sukyung Kim notes, uh, Lim's unbridled movements presented, presented a sharp contrast to the orderly applause performed by North Korean spectators, such that Im appeared to be on par with the leaders in their ability to act in an improvised manner a freedom not bestowed on the North Korean people. So throughout the festival, uh, she gave uh, 12 press conferences and then seven uh, separate speeches, and all of these were unscripted, uh, which is, it never happens in North Korea except for when the leaders give a speech, because they need to go through uh, several stages of uh, censorship and to make sure that there's no sort of unforeseen content. Now, a commemorative postcard, on that, yeah, which we're looking at now, uh, captures, I think, the discrepancies between the flower of reunification and her North Korean counterparts. The image shows him marching in a parade to the May Day Stadium for the opening ceremony of the festival. Surrounded by meticulously outfitted North Korean student representatives, in Malone dons a Western-style t-shirt gifted to her by a foreign delegate which bears the festival slogan and features an image of a male activist rebelliously raising his fist into the air. So you can see here that he's wearing the uh, white bandana, which is a pretty ubiquitous, ubiquitous um, sartorial symbol during the South Korean protests throughout the 1980s. And then it also is uh, rendered in this kind of woodblock print aesthetic that we saw earlier. So clearly trying to reference uh, the Minjun movement in South Korea. The photograph captures him as she lifts her hand in the air as if to mirror the iconic protester pictured on her shirt. In this moment, Im at once appears as an actor in North Korea's monumental propaganda performance for the opening ceremony, while simultaneously aligning her, herself with the recalcitrant South Korean student activists who willfully oppose the state apparatus. Here, Im occupies an ambiguous position that does not align squarely with either side of the divided peninsula. The, photograph, the photographer of the postcard uh, reinforces Im's precarious positioning through the heightened contrast between the foreground and background, registering Im in sharp contrast uh, while, the, while the North Koreans who surround her blur into a dreamlike haze. Dramatizing Im's displacement from the spatial and temporal ordering of the impeccably choreographed event, the postcard situates Im within an indeterminate ideological province thereby signaling the possibility of thinking and acting in ways that perhaps cut across the boundary between North and South Korea, and also the binary, the kind of exclusive binaries characteristic of Cold War purviews. Now, Im also appeared in a lot of um, Minjun works, uh, specifically public works, um, including this banner, and this is uh, a kind of monumental banner that was collectively produced and installed on uh, the, the facade of her university, where she's a French major at the time. And this is uh, immediately after, in the 1990s, she was imprisoned. Um, the, the state ultimately sentenced her to five years. I think she served two, ultimately. But you'll notice in the image, kind of similarly, I think, to 
the uh, postcard that we looked at and then the giant banner painting from North Korea. Uh, these images are gigantic, but we never see the full peninsula, right? only North Korea. And in herself is kind of um, enlarged beyond, uh, larger than life, or at least uh, scale uh, you know, incomparably to the other South Korean student activists there. And so, uh, again, we see her kind of occupying this, this ambiguous zone between the two halves of the peninsula. And I think really uh, signalize, signaling the possibility of trying to think uh, beyond that division. And so I guess I'll just end there and um, uh, by saying, I think I have one minute. Yes. So this was the, the pamphlet that circulated uh, amongst the Minjin movement in South Korea. Um, advertising participation in the, the Pyongyang festival. And I'll just end there by saying that um, I think in the con contemporary moment where relations between North and South Korea, the United States, and this global network of actors um, in continuing to be implicated in the division of the Korean Peninsula, uh, you know, as we stand here in this contemporary moment, I think that looking back to how artists were trying to think about, conceptualize, and uh, sort of reckon with the division might um, prove fruitful in moving forward. Thank you.